<clears throat> well, there you are again. This is the sixth session in our series, and we're trying something a little different. We uh, felt like we got instruction to just take a short break after our last session and come right back and continue, because that last <laughs> session <laughs> seemed to go in about 30 seconds when when one of our crew went over with that card to hold up 10 seconds, I, I knew that their clock was wrong, but certainly we hadn't gone through an hour that quickly. <coughs> but I'll hope that we're right, that we do have instruction to proceed, and, and so we're going to dive right in and pick up where we left off. In the few minutes that we did break, um, a couple of things occurred to me. I um, as I thought back on what we discussed toward the end of that session. And I want to dive back into a couple of aspects um, of our last discussion. One is this, um, <clears throat> we talked about how the door has to be open only a brief time. And I didn't quite finish the point that um, if you really play it out in your imagination that if there was an organization out there that was saying, move out of your world, leave everything, and they literally and physically did that, when you hear more of the particulars of what overcoming are, you could see that if it ever caught on, it would have a significant effect on the structure of things and be a threat to somewhat the system that, that uh, Satan or Lucifer has engaged for society uh, at this point in an age. So it would be detrimental. Therefore, you can see since that is the case, even though you might not understand it yet, but you will as we go on, since that is the case that once, let's say like the churches that began the, in the New Testament, particularly uh, Pauline letters, that um, as those churches continued to stay in the same town and to teach the truth, they, the truth had to begin to be watered down and watered down in order for them to survive. Or every last follower in every little church would have disappeared and in order to protect their endeavor of change in the same way that in 75, we had to disappear in order to be isolated. In other words, we had to be separated out or uh, lifted out in order to be free to do what we had to do. And the same thing would have to happen if you continue to take an interest in this and the further we go, it speaks to you, then you would recognize that, goodness, I'm going to be shortly, literally, physically, drop ra uh, dropping out of the world. Now, <clears throat> also another point that I mentioned briefly was the martyrdom that occurred 2,000 years ago, and, and I said it certainly isn't necessary uh, as an aspect of overcoming, even though the possibility exists. But I feel that I must mention <coughs> that religions that elevate such things as martyrdom are certainly against our Father's kingdom. Our hope is that um, if this aspect of the harvest is successful, that we will be able to do it without too much interference. But if, if the needed interference for us, or I say if it is needed in order to bring us more quickly to where we have to become, in order to be survivable survivable in the kingdom of heaven, then that's the whole issue that counts. Nothing can happen to us, even though from a human point of view, certainly things can happen to us. They could hurt us, they could <coughs> throw us in jail, they could kill someone. I mean, if it got that violent. Now, hopefully the culture we live in here at the end of the age is a little bit more civilized than that. And will put to test, I'm sure, the freedom of speech and the freedom of religion and the freedom to worship God as you choose, and uh, it will be put to the test again, even no matter, no matter how sharp the door is open, and we are quite aware that that test will be out there again. 
All right, now on to the question that June asked as we closed out that last hour. Uh, is overcoming a moral issue or is it a behavioral difference? We talked about how it's not particularly um, a moral issue, even though some things might be more right than other things because they're less harmful. And in a sense, anything that is behavior not becoming our father's household, then in a sense it's immoral. It's wrong. Uh, but in, a, in another sense, it's simply not a, uh, an acceptable way of life. It is, it's a, it's a, the lifestyle in the kingdom of heaven has no place for it. It does not exist. Therefore, if it does not exist, then it needs to be fluffed off or it needs to be overcome. It needs to be risen above. Uh, we talked only briefly about uh, uh, consuming, and I'm sure we'll get into that more in our questions. But uh, to look at it once again, it overcoming is more, let's say, in the kingdom of heaven, for example, uh, since babies do not come in through woman's womb because they're the members in our Father's kingdom are neither male nor female, and they seem to all be about the same age, uh, then to still have a mindset at reproductive activity or uh, sexuality, certainly, uh, or even connecting with the family in that way, that uh, is inappropriate behavior. Therefore, in that sense, it's wrong if you are a potential student, if you are in a position of your growth, if you have come to overcome the world, which I feel that if you're still with us in a positive way, you more than likely have come. And you're probably standing outside that vehicle right now having a hard time with this because everything seemed to be going pretty well until I heard this. Now my I can't sleep at night. I'm being shattered. And you're probably more indulgent in everything than you ever were before because you, you just don't know what's going on. And, and if that's the case, I'm afraid the earmarks might be there, that you might be marked, so to speak, by our Father's kingdom to be a possible recipient of this. But just because our Father's kingdom gives you that gift doesn't ensure it. You still have to pursue it. You have to exert the labor. You have to survive it. You have to develop the muscle. You have to be the one who makes the choice to continue asking and to move forward step by step. And nearly every lesson in the lesson plan comes with a difficult hurdle to make, uh, a moment of unpleasantness, at least a moment. Nearly every lesson, though. Not all but many do. Okay, who's next? Sawyer. Well, did you want to, in discussing the particulars of overcoming, uh, did you want to start with uh, separateness? Yes. <coughs> I'd like to go back to separateness. You know, we talked on a, in a previous session about how death is synonymous with misinformation. Truth is life. If you really went to the root meaning of the Hebrew word of death, it would be separation from God. The actual realistic definition of the term, as it was intended when the language was created by our Father's kingdom, and as members of our Father's kingdom related to those human beings who used the Hebrew language, it meant death meant Separation. And separation is, of course, synonymous with overcoming the world. I separate from the world. What we're trying to overcome is separation from our Father's kingdom. We have been separate. Don't forget, what is it that's coming to life here? It's the soul. Where did the soul come from? Planet Earth? No. The soul was created by our Heavenly Father, created by the kingdom of God. It 
it, it was nurtured by him. It came only from him. So in that sense, every soul that finds its place in his household is returning home like E.T., hmm. wanting to go home. If that soul begins to awaken, it knows I'm going home even though I don't remember anything about home. It's been so long and I've been so tiny and so insignificant and now I'm going to know what home is like even though I've been separated. How many thousands of years have I been separated? So, <clears throat> and more than likely those of you who would choose to separate at this time and, and let us assist you in your birth and you're going through this canal, you would, the pangs that you would experience would, and put you on the other side, would be unequal to anything that you have ever experienced before. And you can realistically know that, this sounds like we're trying to set you up to feel good about yourself, but it's not really the case. You came from the kingdom of heaven to do this. You have been saved, you've been set aside in our Father's kingdom. You also got a briefing before you left on what you might expect. You got some assistance in picking out a vehicle that you could associate with to some degree even from inception or conception. And then now that vehicle you have to take over, dominate it. The soul has to come to life. The flesh has to become, in a sense, dead. No voice. Just a living mechanism that will permit you to do what you want to do within the bounds of a lesson ground. So separation from our Father is the number one, top of the list type thing of overcoming. We're trying to destroy separation. We're trying to get back to our Creator. Get back to our only real Father. Now even though <coughs> our Father's Kingdom in this particular age that we're in did associate with, like we've talked about before, the Jews and those who followed uh, Jesus, and, but think way back in the early parts of the age when our Father's Kingdom even hovered over the camp and a spacecraft or a cloud and related to them and gave instructions to Moses and to the priests and, and they saw this fire there and they saw this cloud at certain times of day and it was a cloud at other times and, and it would move and it would follow them where they would go and they'd have a place where they could go and sit and and uh, concentrate on the lessons that they were receiving. So in a sense, our Father's kingdom actually had a member from that kingdom in the vehicle from that kingdom, nurturing them, taking them through certain lessons. But believe it or not, the human beings that they were associating with very quickly lost sight of the value of that and the importance of that and wanted their own way. I want this to eat. And they'd say, well, I do, you shouldn't be eating. Well, I'm, I'm tired of eating this. I want to eat that. And I need to uh, uh, do this. And so pretty soon the member says, well, I can't tell you what to do. You have to make choices. You're no good to our Father's kingdom if, you, if I force you to do something. I can lay before you what would be best for you, but then you have to make the choice. And if, if you insist on compromising it, then I'll help you even pick your compromise in the least harmful way to you. And so that whole business from Egypt and then into the Promised Land and all was just making one compromise after another for the sake of the ones who continued to turn away from the will of the member of our Father's Kingdom that was seeing them through that process. Let's go on to our next aspect. June? Well, I think you kind of touched on this, but what about independence, doing what you want to do when you want to do it? Well, I don't feel that I've really touched on it because, boy, is that a booger. <laughs> if there ever is an influence that's certainly up in the high, hard-to-overcome area, that's certainly one that's difficult for many individuals. Uh, and uh, Lucifer certainly knows, knows how to get a grasp 
in that one because that's one of his strong points. That's one he likes to keep you thinking or happy and is doing what you want to do when you want to do it. Once you start in the overcoming process, you, you don't have that freedom. You have the freedom to walk out the door anytime you want to. But when someone is assigned the task of taking you through a birth canal from the human kingdom into our Father's kingdom, it's not like the one who took the tribes from Egypt into Israel making compromises because the, they kept insisting upon it. It's a different timetable. And the member from our Father's kingdom that is a representative associating with you in that transition isn't willing to compromise that much or does not get instruction to compromise that much. They'll compromise a little and then they tighten the belt again. Because the object is we have a short time to get a long distance. And in order to take advantage of the short time, then it does require very accelerated forward motion. And that accelerated forward motion does not leave the door open. I can remember that in that Wyoming campground that I referred to after those nine months of running around holding meetings, then all of a sudden T and I had to start saying, uh, we can't get anywhere. We can't have our little meetings. We can't have our sessions if, if we're just so disorganized that this bunch is running off to the laundromat at this hour and that bunch is running off to the grocery store at that hour and this one is doing that. And so we had to, for sake of getting somewhere and having some instruction and making a, a laboratory classroom out of it and changing our vernacular and changing our habits and changing our ways, we had to have a structure. And that structure then immediately became an infringement on doing what I want to do when I want to do it. And so the individual that was still dealing a lot with, <laughs> I need that pizza. We haven't <laughs> had pizza for, for two weeks, or we haven't had pizza for three months. And I, we haven't been to the picture show. Or the, when we do go to the picture show, it's not the one I really wanted to see. Or, uh, I, I really feel like I need so much of this to consume or, or so much of that, and I don't like okra or whatever it is <laughs> that I found on the, on the menu yesterday. Well, we talked a few minutes ago about, to a large degree, the path of overcoming is one of liberating you from structure. And in a sense, at this point, you could kind of compare overcoming this world to a preparation program for God's astronaut program. It's like if we're going to go to a place where you can't just run off when you want to run off and have what you want to have and do what you want to do, then you have to know that you have control, that you don't need to have your pizza when you want it. You don't need to cat around for couple hours at night and run your car up and down Main Street. You don't need to do this or that. That you have grown up to the point that what your only concern is being a crew member, being a part of a crew. And whatever the crew is assigned to and whatever the crew wants to do, insignificant or significant, you are crew-minded. You are crew-minded. Instructions are given to the crew, and you as a crew member are crew-minded. So one of the major difficulties that happens is this difficulty of getting rid of what I want to do when I want to do it. Don't forget it isn't really what you want to do when you want to do it. You, this brings up an interesting point, <clears throat> in a sense, even though we're the little guy who has the control of the option button and because of our free will as to what we listen to and what we don't listen to, in a sense we're mediums. We're all mediums. I don't like mediums in the sense of the spiritualist church or the New Age um, mediums, <clears throat> but I'm not condemning them. They're, they're at levels of pursuit of 
trying to improve their knowledge. But in a sense, we are mediums. And, but what's funny is that when we're in the world, we, since there are so many discarnates out there, so many individuals outside of bodies, that they use our body to do what they want to do. Now, a lot of times you've seen illustrations of that in a person that, that uh, psychologists or psychiatrists will write a book about or show a television show about of multiple personalities. And even to the degree that if this, if this vehicle permits it, and if the soul that is supposed to be more strongly identifying with that vehicle permits it, those individuals who are in the discarnate condition will even come in and identify their name. And they'll be, wow, all these multiple personalities. When Jesus said, when your eye is single, you're full of light. And that means when there's only one soul in there, there's only one pillowcase, there's, it's only you. So it wasn't really you who liked to run and do when you wanted to do it. It was you permitting others to use you to run when they wanted you to run and indulge in what they wanted to indulge because they could only get feeling and satisfaction from participating in your vehicle and, in a sense, cohabitating in your vehicle with you in order to get their desire taken care of. So in that sense, we're mediums. Our desire is to become vessels, in other words, same thing, for the mind of our Father's kingdom, but certainly not in the sense of that humans interpretate, interpret mediumship. Because even though we would like to be able to kind of get in some unconscious or <laughs> trance state and say to our older member, just use us, I'll disappear, you use us. He says, no, that's ridiculous. We're not that stupid. Come on now. If, if you ask me, I'll feed you information if, it's, if you're asking the right thing. And if it's information that I have instruction to feed to you, then I'll give it to you. And in that sense, we, we are expected to grow up a little bit and understand how that mechanism of information works. What's our next question? Well, in, in overcoming independence, what about like needing recognition or attention? Okay, so in a sense, this wanting to do what I want to do when I want to do it, that's a kind of independence. We'll call that, we said separateness is kind of uh, top of the list and we'll make independence maybe somewhere close to the top of the list of something that needs to be overcome. And you said independence, is it also like needing recognition or your ego. Or ego, that's good. Independence, ego. I'll say that, believe it or not, even that for the most part is not you, but it's someone from the other side wanting to, who has not overcome, wanting to, or it could be you because you're still listening to that. A lot of times we listen to the influences that we're still into. So we can't really blame the influence because anytime we listen to influence, then we obviously haven't overcome it ourselves or we wouldn't be listening to the influence, have we? Mm -hmm. So independence or ego, um, if I need attention, if I need recognition, if I want to amount to something, then these are the qualities even that were taken from the human kingdom, even into our Father's kingdom, long, 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 long time ago, by someone called Lucifer. He still couldn't get his eye off of himself, wanting to be somebody, being impatient with his assigned task, his being a member of the crew, his having to wait for instruction to come down. And he wanted to be somebody. He wanted to develop. He wanted to... and then that meant that he didn't trust in the one who was taking him through development. A lot of overcoming is a matter of patience, a matter of waiting. I mean, we spend a lot of time waiting, learning to overcome being disturbed by waiting or threatened by waiting. But 
Independence is certainly synonymous with separateness. It's certainly synonymous with ego, selfishness, wanting attention, wanting to uh, have identity, wanting to have its own flock, wanting to have its own corporation. So, yes, if that's something you've had to deal with that you have not overcome, and most have to deal with it to a degree when they're in the human kingdom, then this is another on our list of helping you understand some of what you're up against if you still need that recognition or if you still need that independence, that separateness. What's next on our list? Well, what about rebelliousness? I'm afraid I would pretty much treat rebelliousness as just a side symptom of independence. Rebelliousness is just a next step of independence. It says, uh, I wanted to do it and you didn't let me do it, so I'm going to rebel. And unfortunately, then you find yourself on the threshold of saying, I can't force you to do it. Uh, uh, this isn't the name of the game of forcing someone to do it. I can't make you, make you, make you do it. You have to make me, make me, make me re-help you, re-help you, re-help you. The initiation has to come on the part of the seeker, repeatedly, repeatedly. If the thirst is weak, we're, boy, are we in trouble. If the desire to change is weak, are we in trouble? Because the teachers don't get anywhere when they see us going slow and they try to impose it on us. It just doesn't move. The movement forward occurs in direct proportion to the thirst of the individual. The desire for change, the desire of speed in that change, the muscle exerted to control that change, to rise out of that desire and discard it and look for something better and be ready for it and say, here I am, I'm ready for the next step and the next instruction. Of course, you'll be surprised those old tests keep coming back. Because, and the next level sends them back to us to be sure that we've really licked them and to give us another little chance to prove that we have. We can re-examine them. Sometime they come back even stronger. We thought, wow, I thought I'd gotten past that one. Didn't have to deal with that anymore. Then some night in the middle of the night or in total surprise, you have something return that you thought you had really overcome and comes at such a shock. And, but pretty soon you get wise and you know that it's going to return. And you're prepared for it. But you don't think about it. If you fear it and think about it, you're inviting it. So you have to block it. It doesn't exist. Don't even acknowledge it. It isn't there. And then when it comes and you're surprised, you deal with it. You get rid of it. And then you learn to be quicker at dealing with it, quicker and quicker and quicker, so that, like at first, you might make the mistake of hearing its argument. And then soon you hear less of its argument and less of its argument. And then as you progress, then you even begin to smell it before you can even identify its argument. And you put up a block for it. You put a big old Yale lock on that door before it gets to the door because you could smell that particular quality or characteristic returning that you had once listened to. What's next on our list? Well, it occurred, it occurred to me when you were talking about independence that our viewers might not, will they be left void feeling? Uh, if they get rid of their independent thinking? No, I'm glad you brought that up. Yes, that, that's good. <clears throat> uh, the more you overcome, the more you, you know, when you run around in the human world, all of these discarnates that are, are um, using you to be their medium and they're having their own pleasure through you, they also are really making a place for you in the world. I mean, they give you identity. They give you success and career. They, they uh, <clears throat> for example, uh, it does not mean that if a soul is in a vehicle and that soul very quickly is a child prodigy at the piano, that that soul was necessarily a good pianist at a lifetime. That soul may have had just a little bit of piano experience in a previous lifetime and then a real a uh, proficient pianist says, I've found one that has enough proficiency that I think I can hop into and boy, can we go. And then does that 
vehicle, and that's so get excited because here comes a, a pianist uh, in, and this uh, person has developed into a, just an astounding success as a pianist because he had the needed ingredients for this soul that was not really the one that could have taken possession. Now, actually, any of those souls can take possession if they want to. A lot of them don't really want to take possession. They just want to use. Because once you take possession, then you're responsible for it. And you've also endured running everybody else off, all these other cohabitating influences that were trying to utilize that soul. But that independence thing, uh, like I said, really wasn't independence. It was these other influences, these other discarnates, using you to accomplish what they want to accomplish. So to answer Sawyer's question, as you run those guys off, you begin to lose your talents. You begin to lose your identity. You, uh, you'll, everyone, everyone arrives at a condition where they say, I, I, I just don't even know who I am anymore. I, I've just... I've just lost everything. And even though that can seem so traumatic to them, it's the best place they can find themselves. Because at that point, they can turn right around and say, I must be succeeding in this task of overcoming it. What do I want to be? I want to be putty. I want to be putty in the hands of my Heavenly Father's kingdom. That's what I said I crave. Now here I'm put to the test. Do I crave that? Do I do I care whether I, 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 or do I want only to be a servant? Do I even want to be a servant, or do I just want to be any servant? Do I want to be available? Am I satisfied with being available and not interrupting, not causing problems, but being someone who can contribute. Maybe if all I can contribute is to mix the batter for the cake, then can I do it without causing problems with the other crew members? Can I do it in a right relationship with them? Or do I want to shine somehow if I still got that much that still <coughs> needs that? <coughs> Excuse me. This is all a part of going through that wound. <coughs> As a soul in the human kingdom, goes through a womb in order to re-enter, it does the same thing. It loses its identity. It loses the consciousness of who it was. Now, all this effort that's been made by metaphysicians and certain New Age groups to have life readings to, to try to help people identify with their past, I'm afraid it does more harm than it does good. It, it doesn't do any harm to know that you've more than likely had a past, and it might have been a lengthy one, but if, if I connect you with that past and try to bring it into realism, I can also turn on old buttons that you worked hard to turn off. I can remind you of your alcoholism, or I can bring it back into place, or I can remind you, whatever it was that you worked so hard to overcome. And knowing that past is of no significance, there's only one past that is of significance to you, and that is your past relationship with your Heavenly Father and His relationship with this kingdom, His relationship with His representatives, your relationship with His representatives, His kingdom, and anyone else that was associated with His kingdom that you have come. That's the only past that is of any significance to you. Any, I don't believe that T and I could, I believe we can safely say, that we cannot remember, nor do I expect that we will remember when we're back in the activity of our Father's kingdom that we will see a posting of a piano concert anywhere. Or that we will see a posting of NFL football game. Or of the Presbyterians. Or of any other profession that I could think of that exists in this kingdom level and does not exist in that one. Now those, I'm not condemning those things. They were, they were lesson grounds. They were stepping stones. They were places to get into, learn from, and get out of. 
and to rise above, to see through, to get new values and see that they weren't as valuable as you thought they were. Uh, a real irony here is that from our father's point of view, the most intelligent, or what humans would call the most intelligent people and the most schooled people and the most really scholarly people are most usually, from our father's point of view, the most ignorant. Frequently, the person who has no schooling at all, who might at this moment be a street person, or a wino, or live in the sticks in the Appalachian Mountains, but sit out on that little mountain and talk to their God all the time and wonder why it is that they feel guilty about some of the conduct that goes on in their life and in their household. And sometimes the most simple people that deal with the most simple problems get closer. And they usually are simple people dealing with simple problems also because of their relationship with their father. I mean, don't forget, growth pattern is when I ask, he usually presents me with something that I could see as a problem or I can see as a positive and move forward from that. What's next on our overcoming list? Well, if you think we've covered independence for the moment, should we move on to overcoming sexuality? <laughs> Overcoming independence for the moment and talking <laughs> about sensuality. I'm sure we'll come back to independence, but sensuality is such a big, big picture, and it is so separate from our Father's kingdom. It is so inappropriate for our Father's kingdom because, as we have discussed, not only the reproductive system is not existent in our Father's kingdom. Of course, sensuality has many aspects. If you consider it all of the senses, the emotions, the moods, the needing of affection, the needing of attention, all of those are aspects of sensuality. The indulgence in stimulants, in needing your coffee or needing your alcohol or needing your booze or whatever it is that you like to hide in. But let's narrow sensuality down for a few minutes to sexuality because it's certainly as major an issue for humans, if not the area that Satan works the hardest to keep you addicted to. I don't know of a human that isn't addicted to sensuality and sexuality. Of course, if they weren't, they wouldn't be a human, so I'm pretty <laughs> safe in saying that. But, uh, now, I must in all fairness say that, that I'll question what I just said because there might be some, certainly some monks and nuns and hermits and ones who, in, even in all kinds of different religions, who keep that intact. I have to talk about something here for a moment that I feel is abominable to the kingdom of heaven. You know, uh, I've even read of groups that are pretty esoteric, pretty hidden, like certain Essene groups and certain monastic orders and certain isolated religions that would even go so far as to stimulate their sexuality as if by stimulating their sexuality it somehow or other sent that energy force, that kundalini, that into the brain and caused uh, the capacity for enlightenment to uh, offer itself in development. That's a counterfeit of the truth. It is true that as you restrict yourself and you separate from sensuality and sexuality, and as you close that door totally and those hormones stop acting in your, in your vehicle, and even when they act, you don't hear them, and you don't give in to them in the least. It is true that then you move into a greater capacity for higher knowledge and higher understanding and more muscle and more strength to deal with things other than sensuality and sexuality. But the counterfeit of that is to, in some sort of ridiculous way, stimulate sensuality or sexuality 
for some kind of spiritual trip that is hideous to our Father's kingdom. That's, that's a perversion of the way control was designed to come. Yeah, I hate to, but I must address that directly. That is not the truth. Even though, certainly, T and I investigated it. T and I investigated it seriously. We studied it as we studied everything else during the period of our awakening. And, but it was made so clear to us that it was not of our Father's kingdom. Now, sensuality... <coughs> Well, I think the next place to begin on this is probably to discuss love. Because Satan has humans confuse love with sexuality. And love in our Father's house has no relationship with sexuality. One illustration that was given to us once to think about was, can you... If you're from my father's house, you cannot imagine yourself in a position of being in the act of sexuality in full, broad daylight, and while in the act, look up at your heavenly father and say, I know that I am only expressing your love. Now, when you become a candidate for our father's kingdom, in a sense, our Father then begins to put your eyes focused on his kingdom and says, I'm a jealous God. It's now time for you, for a period of time, you might have thought you loved me more than you loved those other things, but if you're going to get into my house, you have to love only me. You can't love anything else out there. You love only me. I don't have sex. He says, I don't, I'm not a sexual creature. I don't even have the plumbing for it. We don't do that kind of thing. Therefore, it's obviously not an expression of love as far as I'm concerned. The physical aspect, you know, for a while in our classroom, after T first left her vehicle and I was still trying to get out of the shock of it and help the students through the shock of it, for a period of time, we, if I was gone from them for a period of time and I returned, I would hug them and to try to show my affection for them. And after a while, it began to feel, this is inappropriate. We need to get past this. This is less than right. It may not have done any harm for a period of time, but it's inappropriate. The Band-Aid might have worked, but we don't need the Band-Aid any longer. And that doesn't mean that, that we don't love each other. We do love each other if our Father desires for us to love each other and to the degree that is right from His eyes for us to love each other. But we don't love each other certainly in any physical nature where we need to touch or we need to hold hands or we need to hug or we need to kiss. We don't need those things. And it's safer to avoid them during this certainly more advanced position of overcoming because there might some we might innocently re-trigger something if they were permitted to engage in touching or hugging or, or even kissing on the cheek, that it would re-engage something that worked very hard to overcome. So we certainly don't want to re-engage an old addiction. And withdrawing from the drug of sexuality and sensuality is as difficult a withdrawal, if not more difficult than any other withdrawal. It's tough. And Satan keeps sending it back again and again and again to test you because those hormones keep being stimulated even by things that you might consume or by a commercial that you might see on television. You know, I mean, this day and time, it's toothpaste, uh, trousers. Everything is done based upon the sexual appeal of something. It's hardly a commercial that you can see that isn't based on sexual appeal. So. Sensuality has so many aspects to it. But remember, it is, since it is not a behavior that even exists in our Father's kingdom, then therefore, to someone who's trying to get from here to there, it's something we have to 
go through the withdrawal of, we have to overcome, we have to rise above, we have to have in control, and we get help having it in control. We don't need to fall off the wagon. We learn not even to listen to it. We learn to quickly turn our head. If a magazine would catch our eye in a supermarket and it had pictures on it that would have triggered the vehicle in a previous time, then we quickly don't see it. If a television show or a movie, if there's a moment of, you know, it's almost as if a movie doesn't even hit the sale. It can hardly hit the marketplace if it doesn't have certain amount of scenes in it of sensuality or sexuality. And if you have and if you've really advanced in the process of overcoming, you're very sensitive to those vibrations and you're very uncomfortable with those vibra vibrations. And you have to quickly just, you don't need to stand up and wave a flag or, you know, shout at the audience and say, oh, turn that film off. But you certainly need to control and not view, have control of your eyes, not let it see it, not let it even see it internally. When Jesus said, someone looks upon someone lustfully, they've committed the act. There's no difference. So if we do that act, even in our head, we have certainly haven't overcome the act. We might have taken one step. We're not doing the act physically, but that's just one step. When we don't even permit those thoughts, those images to come into our head. So it's a big item. It's a major item. It has many, many facets and many lessons. Now, I've mentioned things like movies and magazines and, and the fact that we don't just go where we want to, when we want to go. And you could think that we live a pretty sterile existence, and it's only as sterile as, as we like it. But we, and I don't mean for you to misunderstand that, but we view a lot of television. We go to movies. We have a lot of variety in the things that we consume. We have a lot of times to sit and have lessons and meetings, even when we're broken into separate groups in different places. We have all kinds of things given to us that serve as the vehicle for our lessons. Now, it's true that if we had to, over, had to deal with a lot of restlessness, then we have to get control of that. We, we have books to read. We have not only Bibles, but we have all kinds of books to read and just about everything that you can think of, but certainly not things that would trigger or turn on old things that we're working so hard to overcome. Uh, even though some of the books that we might have might have some pages in it of that is the same as when we, when different ones in the class will climb in a vehicle and go to the movie. They, they know that they can see that movie and they can turn off that scene, but they also do censor the movie to the degree that if the movie has too much of that in it, it's, they consider it off their list. They don't want to see it. It's not worth it to them. But, oh, while I'm thinking about movie, I have to bring up that uh, the class recently saw the movie Hook. And um, it was interesting that, and of course, Hook represents the evil or Satan and Peter. Peter Pan represented the good guy. And when Hook had Peter's rightful son in his presence, he wanted really to see if he couldn't get Peter's children to see him as father and to imitate him. He didn't have much success with Peter's daughter. She couldn't quite stop doing anything but missing Peter. But with the son for a while, because the son didn't really understand much about Peter as his father, the son for a while bought into Hook because Hook gave him so much attention and elevated him so, as does Satan. Gives you a lot of attention. He elevates you so, and he even lets you imitate him. He can give you all kinds of success and authority and power and things of this world. But as soon as Peter came back in the picture and and Peter's son really began to see Peter for what he was, the son knew that he apologized to his father and he said, I'm yours, I'm, I'm not, this is not my father. And he quickly realized how much he had gone astray because he, 
he really, and of course Peter felt guilty because Peter felt like he hadn't really let his son know him, that what his son knew of him wasn't enough to win him. So Peter certainly understood how his son could go for hook. Well, I'm sorry, I had to bring that <laughs> illustration up, but it was a good one. And the movie had a lot of good parallel lessons in it as far as the conflict between good and evil are concerned. What's next on our little list? I think there were some particulars about sensuality that we were. Well, yes. Um, would you want to say something about costume and jewelry? And <laughs> <laughs> wow, you, you hit right below the belt, <laughs> or right on the belt. <laughs> OK, this, uh, this gets into an area that um, can certainly, we could certainly switch into a gear where you could say, oh, those that are with this representative or with this group or with this cult, they seem to have an identity. We have a kind of identity that is trying to not have another kind of identity. Since we're moving into a world that is genderless, then we try to not be gender. June is not trying to look like a male. Sawyer's not trying to look like a female. They're trying to be neither. They're trying to be both in the purest sense, but not in the human sense. So what do we do? It's certainly uh, an aspect of female consciousness or to sustain female consciousness would be to use a certain amount of makeup, tend to the hair, uh, go to the beauty parlor, you know, spend time on the rollers, um, earrings, jewelry, tight waist, short skirt. I mean, if we try to think of all the, and the male in the same way, tight blue jeans, tight belt, tight shirt, Mr. Macho, you know, cowboy boots and whatever it is. <laughs> in the same way, both are trying to have no masculine characteristics, no feminine characteristics, but in a sense, still sensitive and, and soft, and, but neither male, genderless. So it is true that they, they cut their hair in the way that's the easiest to care for. They also cut their hair so they don't have to go to the human beauty parlor. They can have their own <laughs> barbershop, right, and wherever they are existing. And so the class members, they cut each other's hair. And some are assigned the task of barbering because they do less butchering <laughs> process than the others. So <laughs> even though whenever I'm with them, I question, who did that? <laughs> <laughs> who did so-and-so's hair? It's not taper paper. And, uh, but they do have a haircut that tries to be pretty much neither male nor female and one that they can handle and it's easy to care for and they can wash their hair every day and it's clean and it's off their neck and they don't have to give it any attention. It doesn't attract any attention out there. And as far as the clothing they wear, they wear pretty much unisex or things that certainly aren't tight fitting and they wear a loose shirt and sometimes the shirt is bought in the store in a department that sells it, both for male and female, and sometimes you'll find the same, same shirt in the, whether you're going to Marshall's or Ross's or some <laughs> of the discount stores that, where you might find the same shirt in the uh, women's department that you'd find in the men's department. The only thing is changing the sizes on them. But they want loose-fitting things that do not accentuate the waist or the hips or any shape of the vehicle. They don't need to color themselves. They don't need to have lipstick or rouge or, though they try to stay clean and neat and well taken care of and try not to vibrate attracting anyone, but they also don't want to vibrate repelling anyone. They just want to be neutral. They want to be just objective. They, they try to control that vibration. And so certainly it affects the item of jewelry, makeup, haircuts, clothing. Um, and as, as hard as they try to kind of be 
unidentified in that way. Whenever they go someplace and then they go back to that place again, like if a partnership goes to a market or and then another partnership goes to that same market that inevitably if they go to the same checkout counter, they say, well, I saw you here just yesterday. <laughs> and it wasn't the same ones at all. It was someone else in the classroom, but, but their vibration seems to be so different uh, that they, whoever it is that's, that's representing that way. We try so hard not to have the clothes look alike, and in spite of our effort, they all seem to look alike in the <laughs> eyes of others. And so we try to work hard at not doing that, or at least knowing that that possibility exists. But it's, you have to examine. You have to say, well, do I need to cling to my femininity? Do I need to cling to my masculinity? Because if you do, you're not really ready to make this transition from the human kingdom into our Father's kingdom. Because if you go back and read your scriptures, you'll find that there, there is no marrying. There is no male nor female. So it is a genderless kingdom. I'm glad we had a chance to get started a little bit in some of these other aspects of overcoming. We've given you a lot to think about. You know, as I look about, as I think about our previous session, I realize that, whoops, as I go over it in my head, I know that we weeded out quite a few in, who watched that session. And some who watched this session will probably weeded out quite a few more. And you keep wondering, where is it going to end is it, will we weed them out so that no one responds? And if that's what happens, if we're doing the will of our Father, then that's all that matters to us. We're not getting any points by how many might listen to us and follow us. We only want to do what is instruction from our Father's kingdom. I see those cards, and that last one said 10 seconds, and that one now says five. And we'll see you in our next session, and we're glad that we're here.